Welcome to the Herbal Hour podcast. Today we have the naturopathic doctor, uh, Laura Gouge, to talk to us on mental health and many mysterious things about the psyche and psychology. So uh, Dr. Laura, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this path and what kind of work you do? Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast today, Bagden. So yeah, I'm a naturopathic physician and currently I practice in Beaverton, so it's just outside of Portland, Oregon. And I'm the medical director for a small community-based mental health clinic called Wolfpack Consulting. And I do predominantly mental health and then a little bit of just general naturopathic care for people with chronic illnesses. So anything from endometriosis to fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, just things like that. So that's what I do. What uh, got you originally interested in uh, mental health and the mind? That's a great question. I feel like it was always something that I had a lot of just personal curiosity with. I was always really into like self-development and in my early twenties, I had a really amazing therapist who just made a huge impact on my life and recognizing just how much like good therapy, self-care, naturopathic medicine, like it made such a difference for my mental health and also in it's not exactly mental health, but in 2017, my mom passed away from breast cancer Mm, and going through just such a, like a profound grief transition, I think really, um, just brought like pain, just like pain and suffering to the forefront of what I really started to see in medicine and in my patients. And you know, I think there's a lot of overlap between grief and a lot of how we suffer in mental health. Like it's, it's pain. It's like invisible emotional pain. And so like, I really had that, that personal interest and then just an opportunity kind of fell into my lap to work for this clinic. And so I decided to go all in on it. That's the fascinating thing about these moments of great uh, suffering and crises is that sometimes they're kind of the root of understanding ourselves and also kind of, uh, you know, spiritual understanding in some sense. I know that's pretty typical that someone will have, you know, crisis, especially uh, the loss of a loved one or any encounter with death in and of itself Mm -hmm. kind of, it it completely changes the way, you know, your mind functions and the way you uh, relate to the world. Um, That's actually uh, for me. So one of the big catalysts in my life was, um, when I was about, when I was about like 18, my brother got in a really bad car accident. He was, you know, he was in a coma and I was pretty sure he was uh, not going to make it. And, yeah. you know, I was still pretty young at that time. Uh, I was interested in kind of like just generally interested in spiritual topics and things like that. But after that, I became very interested in, in meditation, in understanding life, understanding like where that suffering comes from uh, mm-hmm. and really just facing my own, uh, mortality, which, uh, it destroys a lot of the illusion in your life. Like when you realize that the thing that's precious is another person and, you know, the people in your life and that everything you kind of care about besides that is irrelevant when, when it actually comes down to it, that's a big lesson in terms of just being present and and happy in this life. Um, Oh my gosh. I totally agree. I feel like whether it's for yourself or you're confronting it with a, like somebody that you care about when that illusion is shattered that we actually don't live forever and the people around us don't live forever because it's something like I knew before like of course I I understood that mm-hmm. but I didn't have any knowing in my body of like oh my gosh this doesn't last forever like what's actually meaningful to me in this world and I mean it's one of the I think like cliches that comes from grief, like if you really lean into it, is that it really does give you the opportunity to like really explore what is meaningful and how do I want to live my life and what is important to me. And also that pain is inevitable for all of us, whether or not it ever becomes like a diagnosable set of criteria, we're all going to go through painful circumstances in our lives. Mm. Do you think uh, grief has a 
a positive purpose. Like it has some purpose in how uh, humans cope with tragedy and, and suffering. Cause it is a diagnosable condition. You know, if somebody mm-hmm. uh, becomes a widow or their, their spouse dies, there's like an actual psychological diagnosis. Is it called bereavement or? Yeah, I've never diagnosed it in anyone, but I think it's that if grief lasts longer than a certain like period of time, that's when it would become diagnosable. So like immediately after somebody passes, it's, it's a normal response. But if say two years after you're still like acutely like, mm. I have no appetite, I can't sleep, then it, I don't know exactly what the time frame is. Mm. But do you think yeah. that the actual grief that's caused in that suffering is part of the healing mechanism of the mind at all? I, or is it like the mind has gone, you know, awry and something has been missed? I totally think that the grief can be part of the healing process. And it's something that there's an opportunity. Like we can yeah. either lean into it or we can turn away from it. And I think that if we can allow ourselves to lean into that pain, lean into that grief, it like the the ability to lean into the pain is also what can really open our hearts and allow us to live fully in the present moment, live fully in like love and aliveness and all of the good. Um, but I know it's also really hard and really scary to, to like lean into to pain so big. And so, uh, I don't know that everybody finds those silver linings from it, but I think there is opportunity available to us in grief. Mm. In uh, Jungian psychology, the encounter with the shadow side of oneself is uh, one of like the most important processes uh, towards uh, individuation or what might be called enlightenment in another tradition, any kind of, you know, full expression of the human capability, but Mm -hmm. that like the things that we don't want to face like negative aspects about ourselves and other people and aspects of other people that are really just projections from our own negativities about ourselves, our views on life. uh, They're always unpleasant to deal with. I don't think there's any, uh, there's any way around it. And there isn't really uh, many cultural frameworks for an understanding of, you know, what you're feeling is a human thing. You're, you're encountering, something existential that people for maybe millions of years have been encountering, like the death of a loved one or this or that suffering. And that there's like certain, you know, pathways through uh, which one can heal. And we don't have too much of that in this culture. So when somebody is, you know, depressed, they think something is like chemically wrong with them, that they need a substance or they need, you know, a, a pharmaceutical when the underlying issue for why, they are the way they are is oftentimes much deeper and it's more related to existential questions like love and death and uh what is what would be a good life for a human to live and how you know how people relate with each other yeah absolutely i mean i feel like you said a couple different like awesome things we could go on tangents on there but absolutely i mean i think the I've always been really interested in shadow work just personally and asking myself, oh man, why does that particular trait that that person has rubbed me Mm. like so wrong (laughs) and like trying to look within of like, oh, is that something within me? Cause it's like other people can have really awful qualities and it just doesn't bother me. It's like, why is that one thing, the thing that my mind just like can't let go of? Yeah. Um, So yeah, it's definitely an area of interest and yeah, we don't have the, we don't really have much cultural support for this, whether it's grief or depression or just just painful emotional sensations. I just don't think we have much cultural support. Right. And I think the the disconnect between the mind and body, which is not really true because the I, I, I think the mind and the body exist on kind of like a spectrum. Mm-hmm. Hence why you can influence, hence why the mind can influence the body. So if you do certain meditation techniques, you can you know change your heart rate, change the way your physiology works, or you can take like a certain herb or a pharmaceutical and it'll change the way you think. And so either either way you approach it. Absolutely. Interesting yeah, like thing the- about um about the shadow. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever had like a shadow dream where the mm. shadow manifests itself? So typically in dreams, it's a person of the same gender as you. 
And usually there's some kind of like, they might be the villain in the dream or some kind of like antagonist. That's a great question. I don't know if I have, but I'm also trying to think because like I never, I never named it. I'm definitely a vivid dreamer. Like I'm, mm. I'm a dreamer. I love it. I love going to sleep because I love dreaming. Uh, I've done like dream journals and things like that, but I've never named it like a shadow dream. Mm-hmm. So what's, what's yeah. interesting about that is that even before I was uh, studying Jungian psychology and the idea of the shadow, which is kind of the representation of oneself of all the repressed aspects, mm-hmm. all the aspects we don't want to accept about ourselves, the darker aspects, the things that society tells us are you know wrong and that we repress. But even before learning too much about this theory, I would have these dreams where I would have a dream about myself. Like I would be there and also another version of myself, but it would be like a darker version of me. Like it would look kind of like something like evil about it. Or I remember I had a dream where I was uh, standing next to like myself in like the Mm -hmm. bathroom. And I was like trying to bring this like shadow figure up to the mirror. And it was like resisting being shown in the mirror. So I was like trying to like have it see itself. And I was like kind of like standing and looking. And finally I uh, got that reflection from the mirror. And I felt like this overwhelming sense of compassion for this like me, it was essentially me, like literally it was me in the dream, but also like I was there too, which is kind of very strange, but I had this like kind of compassion for the, the pain that's like embodied in that shadow aspect of oneself that like all the things that one hasn't really uh, allowed oneself to live or hasn't allowed oneself to consider as being part of themselves. Uh, But it was like a really pivotal dream. I woke up, I was kind of very um, emotional from it. And I've had several others, but what's particularly interesting about those dreams is that I literally had a dream where I was in it, but also like a dark version of me was in it, which is, it's crazy that that can even happen. And that you read about it, like that there's the shadow aspect of the psyche that, you know, manifests itself in dreams. It's very Mm -hmm. fascinating. You had any, uh, any wild dreams lately? Anything very... So my wild dreams, I get recurring dreams about the ocean. Mm. So usually it's actually tsunamis. Mm. So it's either that I'm on the coast and there's a tsunami coming or that it just like themes around water. And it's usually like storms and, you know, just exploring it intuitively. And then also doing a little bit of dream work. I think it often represents change. Like I get those dreams when really big things are are shifting and changing for me and they will be stressful, scary dreams, but also I never get hurt by the ocean. Like I'm always fine, even if mm. the tsunami's coming. And I also get kind of weird reoccurring dreams about snakes. Mm. And I don't know what that represents. I've looked in dream books and I don't know what it is. Again, never hurting me, but they're just there. Mm. Enough, yeah, enough that it's sort of like, what's the deal with that? That's weird. Yeah, so what what do the snakes do? Are they are you kind of like afraid of them or <laughs> a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. I've always wondered. This is like a epigenetic trauma. My dad was bitten by a poisonous snake when he was a little oh. boy, and he was fine. It was ended up being a shallow bite because his Levi's were rolled up. Like he was growing up in North Carolina, his Levi's were rolled up, so the snake bit him through the the jeans. But I've always wondered, like, did I inherit that, like, fear of snakes from my mm. my parents, like, from my father? So usually mm. the snakes are just there. And they're just kind of That's around. And I'm scared of them, but they're, like, neutral. They're not engaging or interacting. Yeah. That's uh, fascinating because the snake in a lot of traditions has several meanings. Like, mm-hmm. in, the, in a lot of the Eastern traditions, the snake is a symbol of wisdom and a symbol of mm-hmm. some kind of, like, hidden knowledge. Uh, whereas with... Uh, Christianity and the more Western viewpoint, it's like the, you know, it's like the dark side of life or the monster or the enemy or kind of like even the shadow in some sense, Mm -hmm. uh, like the darker aspects. And there's the myth of, you know, slaying the dragon. Uh, So this, this idea of some kind of reptilian evil monster that exists is, is I think it's deep in our psyche, but it's interesting too, because I think that at least in your dreams, because uh, it's something that happened to your father, maybe it has some relation to it. Like it, mm-hmm. it's some like idea related yeah. to it in some way. Yeah. Um, no, that's interesting. When you talked about that, I feel like the it would be more like shadow and wisdom of like, I don't know, resisting, mm. like, you know, resisting my own power and wisdom when I was younger because I get them less now. 
Mm. Have you ever heard of uh, Asclepius or the Asclepian temples? No. All right. Well, okay. So in ancient Greece, uh, there was these uh, physicians. They were kind of physician priests and they were big followers of Asclepius. He's the uh, Greek god of kind of healing. And uh, so they had temples where people would, uh, around the world would come to visit when they had an illness. They would come to the temple and they did all sorts of medical treatments like diets and therapeutic fasts and, and things of that nature. But they also did uh, uh, dream divination. So the person mm-hmm. would go to sleep in this like special uh, catacombs and maybe they were using psychedelic substances. It's not really well known because it was a kind of a secretive uh, organization, but they would uh, go there with some kind of illness and they would sleep there. And then when they awoke, the kind of physician priest would interpret their dream as like the mode of their healing. So they would go there, they would pray for like answers to their health issues, and then they would interpret the dreams afterwards. Mm. What's fascinating about that is the Asclepian temples were very associated with snakes. Um, And there was at the temples, like there was these sacred snakes that would, they just had snakes there at these temples, just like moving around. Um, And obviously, you know, the caduceus and uh, the rod of Asclepius. So like the, the single snake on the rod and also the caduceus with the double snakes. Um, the snake has long been a symbol of, of medicine in general too, but specifically mm. this. Uh, and I, I, there's, I mean, there's a lot of conjecture as to why it is, but at least from what I understand, it's this, it's this idea in some sense that snakes have some kind of wisdom and that yeah. their wisdom is that poison poison is on like a spectrum like medicine is poison like but mm-hmm. depending on the on the dosage because a snake bite you know can kill you from the toxins but certain snakes have medicinal properties in their venoms too in certain doses and some can even make you hallucinate and things of that nature so i don't know maybe it was some kind of like weird venom psychedelic cult or something but <laughs> i've had dreams of snakes too like coiled up snakes and they've always been very symbolic like yeah yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, so, I love that stuff. So when you're, uh, so someone comes in and they have, you know, a mental health issue, especially like anxiety or depression. Mm-hmm. What's like, what, how do you go about figuring out what, how you can help that person? Mm-hmm. So I think probably the most holistic thing we can all do, no matter what type of practitioner you are, is really taking a good assessment and really taking the time to sit with someone and get the sense of what's really going on. Because if someone comes in and says, oh, I'm anxious, I feel like that can mean so many different things. And there can be so many different subsets of like depression and anxiety disorders. And so first and foremost, just like sitting with them, like what do I really think is going on? And getting a really solid history of like, what are their genetics? What What's their family history like? And when they say anxiety, like, what does that even mean? Like, how's it manifesting for them? What are the symptoms they're experiencing? And then I always want to know about trauma because I think that whether it's PTSD or just a trauma related mental illness, I think that is like very important information as to how we go about treating it. And so as much as I love in naturopathic medicine, how we talk about the root cause, Mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like it's totally impractical because there's usually not just one thing. It's like a big mess of like a, it's like a bucket that got filled with your genetics and then your trauma Mm -hmm. and then your lifestyle. And then what's actually happening in the here and now, like, as our, our life situations are absolutely going to affect our mood on a day-to-day basis. And then, uh, what else? lifestyle, you know, are they moving? What's diet like? Are there food sensitivities? Is there a medical condition that's been missed? You know, if somebody has untreated, uh, like a thyroid issue or sleep apnea, like that alone could make it go away. So like, I think really being thoughtful and trying to get to know someone and like what's going on for them is going to be the, like, honestly, the most important thing. Mm. Uh, I think there's a lot of misdiagnosis and what I would call like drive-by psychiatry, where if you sit with someone for 15 minutes, it's really easy to just put a label on someone and say, oh, it's panic disorder. Oh, it's bipolar. And is it really like, 
maybe, maybe not. But I feel like you end up with, like, I end up seeing a lot of clients who've been told they've had 15 different mental health diagnoses in their lifetime. And that's absolutely, you know, unlikely that they had all 15 of these different things. It's just that different people met them at different moments in time and just put a diagnosis on them. Right. And uh, the thing with uh, the mental health diagnoses within the DSM is they're a lot of them are very theoretical. Like they're just, we're going to call these five symptoms together. We're going to call it this thing, but Mm -hmm. like, you know, 10 people with that same diagnosis have it for completely different reasons, might have completely different manifestations of it. And even knowing the name of the disease, like bipolar, it doesn't tell you what causes it. It doesn't tell you how you can even go about treating it. Um, Mm -hmm. unless, unless one is doing kind of the drive-by psychiatry, uh, way where you just have a diagnosis and then you have like a medication to go along with it. Oh, well, in general, this, uh, this substance is helpful for people with bipolar, but that, uh, that seems to be very band-aid type of approach and it might actually help, Mm -hmm. um, at least temporarily, but it doesn't get to the like deepest roots, which are fundamentally very mysterious and individual for each person. Absolutely. How, uh, how do you feel about uh, like antidepressants and different pharmaceutical use for mental health? Like where, do they have a part in your practice and what do you think that part is? So they definitely have a part in my practice. Absolutely. I, you know, it's like if we just go back to the therapeutic order of really trying to meet somebody where they are, Mm -hmm. I think that's how we decide, uh, you know, is medication necessary? And So if someone is in a state of not being safe, not being stable, not necessarily having the internal resources to do the things that they might need to do, like let's say go to therapy or start moving their body or things like that. Like if someone's truly in a depressive episode, they might not even be brushing their teeth or eating food or taking showers or leaving their house. And so we have to meet someone exactly where they are. And so... I do use medications and I think, you know, a lot of my clients have a lot of resistance to taking them. And so I always want to meet someone where they are. And, you know, if someone doesn't want to take meds, like that's okay, I'll still work with you. Um, And if someone doesn't need medication, I'll say that too. And I, I like to think of them and the way I often present them to my clients is like, if we're looking at needing to address like these, you know, multiple significant factors in your life it's going to take like some work and I think of the meds as the ability to like support your resilience and address the symptoms so that you can do those other things and they can make a really big difference Mm. and I try to be as holistic as possible in my prescribing so I try to find you know the least number of medications at the right dose And I don't always use antidepressants. I think there's a lot of different ways we can use medications to help people when they're like doing healing work. And, you know, if I can avoid it, I also like to do that. You know, if someone could be totally stable without needing meds, of course I want that. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think of it. And, you know, often in my practice, I'm working with people where there's a lot of obstacles to cure. And so starting with the medication is totally appropriate. Mm. Yeah, I uh, completely agree. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And um, I view them in a lot of ways as a kind of uh, like a Band-Aid. But sometimes you need like a Band-Aid because the person's like bleeding a lot. And like you actually need something to kind of level them off, Uh, especially someone who has really severe depression. Because from the naturopathic standpoint, we love all the different, you know, lifestyle and natural therapies like go out on walks and like drink this tea three times a day and take this supplement and somebody who's severely depressed who can't even get out of bed in the morning. You know, you, you try to uh, convince them that going for a walk would be helpful. And like, they might even want to do it, but they just can't. So it's Mm -hmm. like, you gotta start, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Um, There was this uh, woman I was uh, treating a while back at, uh, at Pacific university uh, on the ship there. Um, and she had very severe depression, so bad that she would just kind of be in bed all day long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing that got her out of bed in the morning was her uh, her child like needed to be taken care of. So that was the one thing kind of that was like a protective factor. Um, but 
like we had to go super, super slow with her. Like uh, just go for, you know, five or 10 minute walk around your block every day, like something super manageable and, Mm -hmm. uh, and tiny. And it's, it's actually incredibly amazing how much, you know, just a walk through nature or just taking a few minutes to do a breathing exercise can tremendously, uh, uh, help someone in like a severe depression. So the way I view it is a lot of these, um, they're, uh, depression is kind of like a reinforcing thing. Like it kind of gets into a cycle and it's almost impossible to, uh, to break out of it. And it kind of like the more one gets depressed, the less one feels that they're able to do. And therefore the more depressed they get. So it's like, becomes this like self-fulfilling prophecy and and cycle. And sometimes all it takes is just like, just like shift it out for a moment, see that something else is possible. Um, so, so as far as, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, PTSD. Yeah. What do you think causes PTSD? Right. So there's certain people that have a traumatic experience mm-hmm. and like one person, you know, they are affected by it, but they kind of recover and they're fine. And other people, they kind of, their life gets derailed after like some pivotal experience. Yeah, absolutely. So an acute trauma occurs And what exactly is interpreted as a trauma is going to be individual. Uh, There's a really great um, trauma therapist named Dan Siegel, and he defines it as just any experience that overwhelms our capacity to cope. So it could be really big or smaller. And after trauma, 80% of people are not going to develop PTSD. Only 20% Mm. are. And so why is that? Right. And I don't think there's just one, there's not just one reason. It's going to be a combination of your genetics, your life circumstances, different socioeconomic factors. Have there been other traumas, you know, because it's, it's less common that someone just experiences like one acute trauma in their life. And then there's no others, you know, for most people where they were in a traumatic situation, usually it was ongoing. Sometimes it's rare, like, yeah, you know, there was an earthquake and that was really traumatic and it's like one thing, but often it's more complicated and ongoing. So I think it's like, you have to look at the whole, the whole picture. Mm. Do you think trauma has to do with the uh, stress response at all? And kind of that system, like the HPA access going, uh, you know, off the rails when some very traumatic event almost like forces them to adapt to yeah. a, a scenario that might not be continually happening, but was, especially like soldiers, you know, overseas fighting in battles when they're there, they're fine. But when they come back yeah. and try to reintegrate, they, it's like, they're still there. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. It's that it's like your, your body is your nervous system and your stress response is still as if that were occurring. And so there's like the flight, uh, like fight freeze mm-hmm. response that happens and you can end up hyper aroused or hypo aroused. It can still both be PTSD, mm. but absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like that's where the healing work begins too. It's in integrating the trauma so that you can be present and calm in your nervous system and then stay calm over time as inevitable triggers occur. And then, you know, hopefully continue healing and it takes Mm. time. Mm. I've uh, heard an interesting theory about uh, trauma Mm -hmm. that trauma occurs in, uh, in many cases because there's an encounter with something, some event or some occurrence that doesn't fit into one's worldview. And -hmm. especially in terms of it being like the darker side of life, like related to, to death or violence or, or something that, for whatever reason, the psyche can't handle the the intensity of the experience. Um, it's pretty typical for uh, for soldiers uh, who do have PTSD. In in a lot of cases, it happens from things that happen to them, but mm-hmm. even more so from things that they've done that they're not able to uh, kind of integrate into their mind. So like you know, they had to make tough calls. Maybe they injured somebody who like was, was innocent or whatever. And those are the kind of events that a lot of the times lead to uh, trauma, at least in, in soldiers, like, like 
it's meaning based, like something really senseless and meaningless and terrible happens. And there's no way to really reconcile it or to make it go away. There's no like explanation for how, like, you know, wh- why is there war and why were people, you know, killing each other in masses? And there's no uh, way to kind of easily integrate and be able to adapt to those kind of scenarios. Absolutely. It's, it's, I feel like it's exactly in alignment with like, like we're both saying really similar things, but when it, it just doesn't seem to match with your current worldview, it'll then overwhelm your ability to cope with it. And then it, your brain just kind of is like, oh my God, like, and then you can develop like either PTSD or not everyone goes on to develop full on PTSD, but they might just have uh, mental illness symptoms directly related to that trauma. Mm. Do you think uh, trauma can be stored in the body? There's a, a lot of these different branches uh, of psychology, psychiatry, and think that uh, these traumas are somehow stored or encoded in the nervous system or in the musculature. Mm-hmm. What's, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, from that energetic place, I do, I do think that we can tense and hold and store like our traumatic experiences. And I know a lot of really effective trauma work is around the somatic healing and it's actually in doing body work and doing trauma-informed yoga and really allowing the body to begin to feel safe in the here and now. So it's like, is it stored? I don't know, from the woo-woo perspective, I do think so. But also just from a common sense perspective, it makes sense that if we're in an anxiety state, we're going to be holding our bodies in a specific way in that by learning to relax in the here and now, the brain can follow. So I feel like from both perspectives, it's like, I don't know exactly what's happening, but I feel like they both could be true. And then there's a a catharsis. Have you, uh, Mm -hmm. like when somebody has a, you know, a, a problem that's been bothering them for a long time. But uh, some people, when they finally, you know, break through into that issue, they'll mm-hmm. have, you know, uncontrollable sobbing and body shaking and all sorts of very uh, strange kind of like movement phenomena. Um, and then at the end of it, in, in some cases, the person's issue is resolved. So I, yeah. I think that uh, in some cases, th- that seems to be some some interesting evidence for the fact that somehow there's some kind of mechanism that the body can do to like discharge, like Mm -hmm. whatever that psychic trauma is, whether it's through crying or through like moving in a certain way. Um, And that's really, that aspect is really mysterious because you would think like, how is that helpful? Like why, first of all, why do we cry and why does it seem like it's uh, helpful for us? And especially that full body crying that happens for some people after, you know, it has like a, almost like a healing effect uh, for them. But the, the reason why that is, is very strange. Yeah. I mean, well, if you look at animals in nature, when they like have a near death experience, they'll, they'll shake and they'll discharge the, the stress hormones. And so I think it makes sense that we would do it too. We just don't always have the language to name it. And so mm-hmm. we might mentally interpret it as something wrong. Like, Oh, this is so big. I shouldn't, this is not right. Even though it, actually is the body just doing what it was intended to do Mm -hmm. for somebody with uh with ptsd what is what is your approach in terms of do you use any certain like herbs or do you uh use mindfulness therapies or how do you go about helping this person you know get over their trauma yeah well i always take a pretty slow gentle approach with people when there has been a really significant history of trauma And there's always therapists on board. I mean, that's always going to be the gold standard, whether we're talking about children or adults. Um, Therapy is absolutely necessary. So my role is always secondary. I would say that my approach ends up addressing the symptoms. So really trying to look at what is impacting them the most And the goal is going to be to try to calm the nervous system and support the mood. So I'm just trying to think exactly like, because I feel like there's so many different things and like so many different modalities. So a lot of times we're supporting sleep. A lot of times we're supporting nightmare disorders. A lot of times, uh, you know, I will use 
antidepressants, more so in adults than in kids, but um, we'll use medication. And then I would think about herbs and supplements that are going to help us calm the nervous system. And it's like pretty slow and steady. Like I wouldn't say there's like a magic bullet for it. It's just trying to look at what is bothering them the most and seeing if there's physical interventions that we can provide that would help with that. Mm. I do use mindfulness, but I say I use it with caution. Mm. I think that if you just tell someone with PTSD to go do the Vipassana meditation for 30 minutes a day, it could be really challenging because their body may not be a safe place and there could be really intense physical responses, whether it's heart rate going up, feeling sick, getting really intrusive thoughts. So usually I would start with mindfulness in the office where we can actively utilize like grounding techniques and like really staying safe and in the body with the ability to like have another person there to help you regulate. And I might use breathing techniques, gratitude exercises, visualizations, and then sometimes doing actual like meditation, but I think it would be very personal. And part of that's just having that trauma-informed approach of, of meeting somebody where they are. And mindfulness is always going to be really important in the healing process, like the ability to begin to just allow your body to be as it is and increase mm-hmm. that level of self-awareness and feeling safe. Mm-hmm. And that can take time. Like it's Mm. not like an overnight thing. And so I think a lot of times in the media, when we talk about mindfulness, it's like, oh, it can cure your insomnia and cure your anxiety and help all these things. It's like, yes, it might. There are a lot of benefits. Like I I personally have meditated for a long time and I think there's amazing like qualities to it. And I don't prescribe it as like a way to get better because it may not, because things may get way worse at first when you suddenly like drop in and get really present to what's going Mm. on in your body. So I tend to use a pretty slow and steady approach with any kind of mindfulness intervention. That's the interesting thing about uh, mindfulness is it kind of uh, trains yourself and your mind to be able to be aware of those patterns, to be able to see those thought patterns come up, to be able to see that kind of bodily response Mm -hmm. and to be almost objective in some sense and see that, you know, even the thoughts and the bodily experience we're having are not not necessarily caused by us. They're more like phenomena that's happening. But when you yeah. have that objectivity, you can examine and you can act differently. So for me, one of the biggest gifts of mindfulness in actually helping someone heal is that uh, first, it just generally calms your mind enough that you have space in between something happening and a reaction. So somebody says something to trigger you, Uh, typically if you're not being mindful and you're kind of in automatic unconscious mode, you just, there's Mm -hmm. an instant reaction and that reaction feels the fire and it makes things worse. But if there's a mindfulness of it, you actually feel the emotion come up and everything, but you have a moment to still decide how do you, uh, how do you act? And I think that's one of the really pivotal things is mindfulness puts you in a place to act differently. Mm -hmm in so far as it allows you to see what actually is. Cause at, as we were kind of talking about before different mental issues, like there's very complex and very specific uh, reasons for, you know, that are very specific to the individual that there's no way that they would really know, Oh, why do I, you know, get this stress response or what triggers my, you know, PTSD, what like mm-hmm. brings it up without that awareness, you can never find out. And it's that person has to be aware because it's within their own mind and their own, uh, being but your point about it being too much for some people is definitely it's a it's a good point because uh when you're in a lot of pain you're suffering you're trying to get away from that feeling you're trying to get you don't want to you don't want to deal with the thing that you're afraid of and you're trying to avoid uh trying to like for good reason repress out of your memory but yeah sometimes you you can't you know and it's interesting with ptsd people have dreams of like the exact event repeating every night it's like Absolutely. And it can be really distressing where it's horribly interrupting sleep or people don't want to sleep. And then it's like, they're like, if you've ever had a really bad dream, I know I have, when I have a really bad dream, I can feel like icky the next day. Mm -hmm. It's like in my memory and I'm just thinking it and reliving it. And so, yeah, if if people have nightmares, that's often, that's often where I'll start. (laughs) 
Yeah. Hmm. So what is, what is some of the most uh, mysterious things you've encountered or kind of fascinating things about working with the mind or other people with mental health things, like things that you didn't expect to be the case, kind of big insights? Hmm. What are you thinking? Like mysterious, like surprised me? Yeah, surprised. Or... Like you didn't like no, t- no textbook wrote about that or something like that where you saw something kind of kind of interesting or maybe a pattern you noticed in patients with like anxiety, depression or any mental health thing? Mm-hmm. I think... I'm just trying to think, you know, I mean, a huge pattern that I see is just this really common tendency towards emotional dysregulation. Mm. And I feel like it's not something we really talk a lot about, but it's the, you know, it's the inability to soothe ourselves. It's that when big emotions come up, we get really overwhelmed and it can just throw us off and lead to big problems, whether it's in our relationships or our work or just our ability to cope with day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that emotional dysregulation can come up with so many different like underlying causes, whether it's anxiety, depression, uh, like borderline personality, ADHD, we can really easily dysregulate. And so I feel like learning to tolerate distress and learn how to regulate ourselves, both through like connection with others and learning how to soothe ourselves. Uh, It's not easy, it takes time, but it's like a huge theme, I think, in anyone who's struggling with mental health stuff. Mm. I would also say just how much, I mean, just trauma is underlying so much of the mental and physical illnesses that are like, currently so common Mm -hmm. and I think it's really starting to kind of trend and people are talking about it like I feel like everyone's talking about trauma-informed care right now and it's like really popular but it's definitely something that I see yeah Mm. big uh big insight for for me that I've noticed is how how much these different you know mental health issues are related to the situation the person is in and how much it really matters, you know, their day-to-day choices and the way they Mm -hmm. live their life and whether they have uh, a sense of like meaning or they feel like, you know, they're moving towards something or, you know, they even have some amount of just joyful activities throughout the day. It's always caught in like, this culture is very interesting because it's, it's really great in the sense that it is, uh, you know, it's growing a lot of things, it, you know, industrialization and we have technology, but it keeps people in the state where they feel like they always have to be like working at something or other. And then the time for actual activities that are just joyful and have no purpose is lost. And, you know, that's a pretty, pretty quick way to, to become pretty depressed um, is just never playing, you know, in, in your life or never just like enjoying or, or yeah. being out of nature or really anything that, are kind of the essential nutrients that a human needs, like to be outside, fresh air, sunlight, uh, connection with people. Like those are needs that are just as important as, you know, what, what we eat. And I think that that's like a big insight um, for me in terms of mental health. Cause the first thing uh, that most people think of when they think of, you know, depression or a mental health issue is that it's like a chemical imbalance. Mm-hmm. that that's what's important about it that oh like your serotonin levels are low so we'll give you this it's like it's like in a in a sense maybe maybe for some small percentage of people it really is like genetic and like they really do have a chemical imbalance but in a lot of cases like the the levels of the different neurotransmitters are indicative of the situation not like they're more just like a sign of what's going on like someone doesn't have you know dysregulated neurochemicals necessarily because of you know something physiological but maybe because of the amount of stress that they feel all the time and um you know living in conflict with oneself causes a lot of stress like Mm -hmm. being in conflict with your own desires and your own expectations for yourself absolutely i mean i think that like actively cultivating both like joy playfulness 
And sometimes I would even just call it aliveness, like Mm. the things that make us feel full of life Mm. are really necessary because a medication might help somebody get out of bed, but it's not necessarily going to lead to the, probably their ultimate goal of like Mm. feeling really well. And, you know, I feel like happiness is fleeting. It's like any other emotion that comes and goes, like the goal isn't to feel happy 24 seven. It's more like to feel calm and peaceful and in alignment. Like, I think those are good goals, but also it's to pursue things that make us feel alive. And it's like all those things you mentioned, it's like, you know, I feel most alive when I'm really connecting with another human or when I'm in nature, when I'm moving my body, when I'm eating really tasty food, when I'm just doing those things that make me feel, you know, just like even a little adrenaline or a little bit of excitement. Um, It's so important. And we don't all necessarily have that right now. Like, I feel like our culture doesn't really celebrate it. You know, we celebrate like work and money and doing stuff all the time. And it's really easy to start feeling disconnected and depressed if that's like, just like face down, just working and grinding all the time. Right. And that, that's interesting too, within uh, medicine and especially mental health that it's thought of, um, you know, helping someone like not be depressed, but that's not like a positive state. That's not like, how do you help someone be like joyful and have a meaningful life? And like, not just the absence of disease, but like the presence of like health um, yeah. in, in that sense. And I think, uh, Especially as, as you're mentioning during, um, you know, these times with the quarantine situations and all the different stress people are having. Um, I read in some article that uh, suicide rates are like 10 times higher yeah. than they were uh, just in, in the course of a few months. So obviously, you know, situations in the world, they have a big impact on uh, people's mental health and, you know, the ability to, to live their life and not be afraid and to, you know go out to a park or uh, for me being out in nature is probably one of one of those things that always uh, always centers me in myself whenever I like uh, catch myself in a funk for whatever reason I just Mm -hmm. will like put everything down and I'll just go for like a couple hour walk on some you know some trail maybe listen to uh, a podcast or, or some music and then I always feel like a completely different human on the way out and I'm like you know you there's no substance that does that like that can give you the kind of peace that just like doing something joyful will have for you. Absolutely. I know. I feel like time in nature, especially I remember in the immediate period after my mom died, there was a sense of like, I didn't really know what to do with myself. Like Mm. I felt heavy and I felt tired and I had time and I didn't really know like what to do. And I found that going in nature was just what I gravitated towards because there's something about nature where it makes sense. Like if you go into the woods, like it makes sense. Like it's as it should be. And I feel like Mm -hmm. it's a way to connect with both like being in the natural world, which reduces our stress hormones, like being in the trees and in greenery reduces Mm -hmm. our stress hormones, but also just from a spiritual perspective, it it's like a way to connect with something greater than ourselves. Mm reconnecting with our our home you know like the way that we're we're wired to be in those kind of environments yeah absolutely it's it's very fascinating because even within a few minutes of you know being on some trail um i'll just feel way way calmer Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially if you find like a nice tree and you meditate in like a state of nature that's like there's no problems in in that place like they just don't exist yeah just uh living you know in the moment as as a human i think that's probably a big reason for a lot of, you know, mental health and kind of spiritual issues is our disconnection with, um, with nature, specifically with the natural way of living, like Mm -hmm. meaning in the sense that, you know, we're evolved to like live in a certain way to eat certain foods and to get a certain amount of movement and to, we're adapted to a natural environment, which no longer exists so that we, we suffer because of it. Um, because, you know, if you're inside all the time, like that's not really a natural state. Like we're, our, our nature as humans is to, you know, to be walking around and in, in forests and like foraging and, you know, just doing all sorts of different activities, not, you know, sitting at like a computer and like typing something so that there's like a disconnect with um, 
our like biological wiring in a sense that I think that uh, when we reconnect a lot of those so-called problems that we think we had are just because we've like kind of lost ourselves and kind of disconnected from living. Uh, yeah, we're living out of rhythm. Like we're circadian beings and we should be living in a like certain circadian rhythm, but we're not like because of the lighting we have and the screens, like we don't get tired. We don't sleep as we should. We have food available all the time. So we don't eat like on regular, like on a regular rhythm. So then our digestion gets messed up and yeah, it's like we're, we're living out of sync. Mm-hmm. Have you seen uh, like the circadian rhythm disorders being associated with people uh, with like anxiety and depression? Yes, yes. definitely. <laughs> yeah. And when, yeah. when, when that's dealt with, uh, have you ever noticed that like they get better? So like if we're bringing people back into more of like a rhythm, like a daily rhythm and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, and I think part of it is like what you were saying before about having meaning where if the day is just this open expanse with like nothing to do and there's no reason to get out of bed, whether it's Mm. getting out of bed for your child or even for your cat or for your work or for your friends, like just if you have some reason of like, I got to get out of bed, I got stuff that's meaningful to me. It, you know, it's really easy just to not have much of a rhythm. And so you then don't go outside as much and then your appetite's all off and then you can't sleep. And then it's like a cycle where you just start feeling not as good and kind of like uncontained. Like there's no, there's no like boundary to exist within. Mm -hmm. And that, that's yeah. probably uh, like larger of an issue now than it has been before for a lot of people because some people, they can't work because of the situation. Yeah. And they're kind of, they're forced into this like new pattern or they have to work from home yeah. um, for like several hours a day. And um, some people that is like helpful for, and some people it's like disastrous for, like some people really need to like go to like an office and like be there to kind of keep their mind uh, tuned in. Um, yeah. I think most of us do better with some structure and with something to focus on. I mm-hmm. had a really good therapist once who I remember he named it the monkey mind mm-hmm. where it was basically like your mind is like a monkey. And if it has nothing to do, if it has nothing to occupy it, it's going to just like kind of go haywire. And, and that's going to cause pretty, all sorts of havoc. It's going to cause havoc. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a pretty human response. Like there's nothing wrong with you. If you have nothing to, to occupy your mind, it's very normal for it to just start kind of, you know, doing stuff and it just gets really active and restless. And, and so sometimes just even having the simplest thing to need to do every day can help because then it has something to focus on and your mind's trying to figure it out. Right. I mean, I think that's the, the quickest path, uh, in my view of getting oneself out of a funk is just do something that's meaningful to you every, every day for some period of time. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just going to volunteer somewhere or going to support mm-hmm. somebody else, it uh, can definitely help. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to be quote unquote uh, productive, mm-hmm. like reading a book that's fascinating to you is, is productive in ways that are not obvious, you know, uh, yeah. getting exercise in is productive in a way that doesn't, you know, you don't see the the benefits of it in the moment, but everything kind of um, branches out from from that in terms of things that you do. And you know, it's what what's that saying that uh, uh, an idle mind is the devil's workshop or, or something like yeah. that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then one gets exactly. into like Netflix binges and and things of of that nature to like fill the the void of of time. Yeah, we just start looking for problems. Mm-hmm. Mm. Have you noticed um, in your practice the association between uh, like interpersonal issues and like anxiety, depression, like s- people having certain um, inability to relate to people in an adequate way and then that being the cause of their issues? Yeah, I think that, I mean, the relationships we have with other people are just always going to have a huge impact on our sense of well-being. I think that the absence of meaningful connections can be a huge trigger for just loneliness and feelings of depression. 
And then also having a lot of conflict and having challenging relationships can also just be a huge barrier. You know, I know I've worked with people where they were navigating a really hard situation, whether it was with their child or their spouse. And it's hard, you know, it's hard. It's something that, because it's like, we can't control other people. So you can do all your own work, but if you're in a relationship where you're really easily dysregulated or you're not getting your needs met, um, it can have a huge impact on feelings of depression and anxiety. So I know it's kind of like vague and, and like big picture, mm-hmm. but I feel like the connections that we have with other people can make the biggest difference in our lives for better or for worse. Mm. There's a quote from um, Carl Jung. He says that loneliness doesn't come from not having people around you, but it comes from not having people which you can express the things which are most important to you. Absolutely. Like, so that, that element of like meaningful uh, connection. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too um, with, you know, psychology in general and how people can help each other. Sometimes just fully listening to someone and being present and not interrupting can be incredibly healing for someone because they've never gotten a chance to really uh, like talk it out and, and even see what they even believe. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like, most of us have people around us. And then especially with social media, it gives us the sense of having Mm. people around us all the time. And, you know, in a lot of cases, I think it really perpetuates feeling disconnected and feeling lonely because it's the illusion of social connection, but it's not uh, meaningful or deep. And so a lot of us are lacking that experience of feeling really seen and known. And so I totally agree with you that just if, you know, really seeking those experiences where someone just listens and validates your experience, which is why I think therapy can be so helpful. Mm -hmm. It's just that time just for you where you get to be seen and heard and hopefully understood. And, you know, then a lot of times it's like you're able to take that connection with your therapist and then begin to build other safe relationships. Like if, if a lot of us have never had that. And so you start with, with therapy or a good doctor or just some professional sometimes, and then you can take it into your life. Mm-hmm. And speaking is, uh, is like a form of thinking. Mm-hmm. When you speak out your problems, you are in a sense thinking over them. Um, and that's, that's definitely my approach as a, a therapist is not like is bringing forth what is the issue from the person and, and bringing forth the solution also from them because we know the problem and we know the solution. We just need to think it through and to, to talk it out and then get maybe some feedback in terms of, you know, what, what is there? Otherwise, you know, one just applies like theories to, to people and kind of puts them in a, in a box of like, this is the way that you, you deal with it rather than, um, the person dealing with the only thing, you know, that will actually help them is they deal with that. Yeah. That issue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've been interested a lot in, uh, this idea of exposure therapy, especially Mm -hmm. for things that people are, uh, are scared of. I know for phobias, it's one of the, the best, uh, methods and it really just involves, um, exposing someone in small increments to things that they're uncomfortable with or afraid of. Um, yeah. and I think that that principle actually applies to a lot of anxiety and depression because a lot of the reason that people do feel anxiety and depression is because they're avoiding or they're afraid of, uh, activities or things they need to do or conversations they need to have with people that would be mm-hmm. incredibly beneficial to them but they can't because they're like, they have maybe some kind of trauma that's related to that. So they can't really break out of that, uh, that pattern. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've seen it be very effective. It, you know, I'm not a therapist, so it's not something that I do, but I've definitely collaborated where I have worked with patients who were in the care of a psychologist and they were doing exposure work. And I'm most familiar with it with like obsessive compulsive disorder Mm -hmm. and then other anxiety disorders, like you mentioned phobias. And so I think it can be really helpful and it's something that definitely interests me as well. Like I just find it 
like really fascinating and curious. And I've seen it make a much bigger difference when people have said, oh, therapy didn't work for me where it was just sitting and, and talking. If the underlying issue is something like obsessive compulsive disorder, a lot of times you really need that targeted intervention to begin to make change. And I know there's lots of avenues to success. So exposure isn't the only way, mm -hmm. but I think it's, you know, I've seen it be really helpful with a lot of the clients I've worked with. Mm. For your, uh, for your own self-care, what are some things that you really, uh, really often do? Like any, any like teas you drink or supplements or yeah. activities or how, how do you keep yourself basically sane and not, uh, not burnt out? Cause that, yeah. that's a very common issue for it's hard. I mean, it's hard. And I know when COVID happened, like when we started the lockdown, I realized I lost a lot of my normal coping strategies. So it was an adjustment. And so it's definitely been in my mind of just like, oh, wow. Okay. These things really help. So for me, I'm kind of obsessed with walking. I kind of like saying it like that too, because it's the <laughs> simple, it's the simplest thing I do, but I feel like it makes the biggest difference. Hmm. And just the fact that it's really slow and gentle. And so if we're under a lot of stress, something like walking can be really helpful where running is also great, but it, it's more stress hormones. And sometimes what you need is less. Mm -hmm. So really into walking. I try to like always leave time on my lunch break just to like do some gentle movement. And I also really try to actively cultivate joy and obviously I get that with friends and family, but I also try to have things for myself for when other people aren't available. So it's like, not that I always need to be like in connection with another human. So I started learning guitar a couple of years ago and just having like a thing that I'm working towards mm. is really fun. And there's a really great sense of accomplishment when I learn a new song or write something myself. And so I would recommend that anyone struggling with burnout, get a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I love to read novels for years. I would read self-development and like more like medical type books. And while I still read those, sometimes I try to cultivate time just to read for fun, like just fiction and stories and things that are like just something to kind of get lost in. I find mm. those all really calming. What are some uh, novels yeah. that you've, that you're like top most recommended novels? Yeah. Oh gosh. I just read, uh, it's an old book, but I just read The Mists of Avalon. It's the King Arthur story. And it was my mom's favorite book. And I had had her copy on my bookshelf for years. And so when the lockdown started, I read that and just reading like a fantasy novel, essentially about King Arthur. It was so fun. Like it was, it was great just to read that. And it was really long. So it was a great project to, you mm -hmm. know, chip away at <laughs> over mm -hmm. time. <laughs> yeah, you can you can learn so much from uh, novels and and reading. Yeah, have you ever read any uh, D uh, Dostoevsky? Uh, yeah, Wrote, uh, back, back in the day, uh huh. Crime and Punishment. And yep, Crime Brothers and Punishment. Brothers Karamazov, mm -hmm. uh, the idiot. Yes, really, really interesting because it gave me a, a deep appreciation for really psychology in general mm -hmm. because he goes in such depth on his characters and like from every you know facial expression from the way that they say things and the way everything's described it's like it's an amazing immerse immersive story but yeah. you learn things about human nature that's what I think is really interesting about very good novels or mm -hmm. very good uh, literature is even if they're fiction there's often like a lot of truth in them in some in some way and that, that's what makes them both fun and useful too Absolutely. I feel like when we gravitate towards certain novels too, there can be like medicine and magic in them for us, even if it's not about, you know, I'm reading something and it has nothing to do with what I do for work or what I'm dealing with in my life. Mm. There's still often little tidbits in the story where I can take something away from myself. So yeah, I've really come to appreciate fiction more in the last couple of years. Mm. And it's uh, awesome you play uh, guitar. I also have been playing guitar for a bit. And I find yeah. that um, doing something regularly uh, that allows us to express our creativity is often incredibly, incredibly healing. And that's, 
from the standpoint of psychotherapy, art therapy is yeah. a very, very powerful medium for people uh, looking to deal with their mental issues. Because a lot of times, you know, they need to like express what's happening and then, then they kind yeah. of get beyond it. So it's almost, uh, I think of art as like transmuting a lot of those negative emotions into positive ones or positive emotions into, you know, even like higher level, like divine understandings of things. Absolutely. I can only speak from my personal experience, but I've tried art therapy and I really liked it because I can tend to be someone who can be really articulate and really in my head. And I can tell the story without actually accessing the the deeper like self-awareness. I can talk around feelings really easily. And I thought, I felt like art therapy was great because it was like, I just got to see what happened. I just would put the you know, paint or pastels to paper and just see what would come out. Like, is it beautiful? Is it shadow? Is it, you know, what are the emotions I'm feeling as I'm making the art? And so I found it meaningful. I only did a little bit of it. I had a therapist who used that as one modality among lots of others, but I learned a lot just even from kind of dabbling in it. Mm. It's fascinating when they combine the art therapy with uh, like dream interpretation where somebody Mm -hmm. will, uh, you know, they'll draw their dreams over a period of time and also write them all out. Yeah. Um, It's, yeah, it's amazingly, you know, mysterious, the mind and where those things come from, where all those symbols and we, I think we don't really, we don't have as much control over our minds as we like to believe. Like we maybe have like 10% control or something. And then the rest of it is like, coming forth, you know, spontaneously from whatever the unconscious mind is showing up in, you know, dreams and our thoughts that we don't necessarily choose. It's an interesting thing to be a human, especially to be able to be like reflective on, on your own experience. Absolutely. I feel like for anybody who's really like their curiosity was piqued by talking about dreams. I got so much value from keeping a dream journal where just Mm. every morning, no matter what, before I did anything else, I wrote my dreams down in the same journal. So there was nothing else in the journal. It was just a dream journal and doing that day after day. When I looked back at it weeks later, it was fascinating. I was like, who is this person? Because there were these themes and threads and things that if I just woke up and said, oh, I had a dream last night, you just kind of lose it and it's not significant. But when I looked at them over time, it was just, it was yeah. weird. It was that's, interesting. It's like, who am I? That's amazing about dreams is that like dreams will happen in clusters. And as mm-hmm. you were saying, a theme will emerge or some, something that's being worked out. Um, and in a lot of ways, dreams are, they catalog the way the psyche adapts to life and how it grows and, uh, you know, becomes more expansive and becomes more like true to uh, itself. And it's amazing too, uh, just the healing power of dreams. Um, there's this idea in uh, Jungian psychology that dreams are essentially, they compensate the conscious uh, minds. So they're almost like a, they're like a mirror image, like an attempt of the mind to, uh, you know, resolve like issues throughout the day and deeper kind of issues over the course of weeks and months. What's really fascinating about dreams uh, is that people who have never read any mythology, um, they'll have, you know, these mythologically themed dreams with all the proper symbols and everything lined up exactly to that mythical story, but they have never read it. They never saw it. That's really common occurrence for people to have very uh, kind of metaphorical, allegoric dreams without mm. knowing where they come from. And that's kind of where my fascination with dreams comes from is like how you know, different people who have never seen these underlying human stories can have these similar dreams as each other. And a lot of, I think a lot of um, religious ideology and things like that come from whatever that process is that underlines the human mind that uh, speaks in a symbolic, uh, symbolic way. Um, Yeah, absolutely. A couple of years ago, I presented at a conference called the Transcending Trauma Conference. And the keynote speaker is 
really awesome psychologist. If you ever want to check out his books, Mm -hmm. his name's Eduardo Duran, Mm -hmm. but he tells this really sweet story about starting as a psychologist. And just in the very beginning, like all of us just kind of having no idea what to do, like, how do I help people? What do I do? And he tells this really sweet story about how he would just ask people about their dreams and he would just listen and people got better over time. Like he didn't use any of the fancy interventions and I might be mistelling the story. And, but that's what I really remembered from his talk was just how he followed his intuition and how simple it can be where sometimes if people are just looking within, just starting with dreams, it's like a really, it's an easy entry, so to speak. You know, it's not super, we're not having to like reprocess and, you know, go through all of our traumatic life experiences, but just talking about our dreams can be really healing. So that's what I took away. Absolutely. Well, dreams in the same way as, you know, our conscious thoughts throughout the day uh, are a snapshot of what's going on in the minds, but in a deeper aspect too, because a lot of the, the subconscious factors that are playing in have more of an expression during, you know, during the night. Um, yeah, it could be incredibly healing for people, especially when they come to an understanding of what their dreams actually mean related to them. So there's this idea of, you know, you can, there's these like dream books or dream symbol books where you look up, uh, a certain dream, like about snakes, for example, and like snake has a certain (laughs) meaning. Um, but there's the approach of finding what the individual's meaning is in uh, their relation to the dream. Mm-hmm. So there's this technique. I don't know if you, uh, if you use it at all. It was um, pretty, pretty amazing technique in terms of interpreting dreams. It's uh, called association. Okay. So what you basically do is after you track your whole dream, like all the different events, the, the general plot of it, because dreams are a lot like movies and they're kind of like, they have a beginning and an ending. They have like characters, they have like, you know, some kind of climax and, uh, and things of that nature. Um, but you get all that down on paper, then you separate out all the individual elements within the dream. Like if there was like a snake in it, if there was like a house and a tree and then, um, find what like is associated with those, those symbols. Like, so like snake, what's the first thing you think of? Or like, what is it? What do you think the significance is? And you go through each element in the dream like that. And I've uh, done uh, quite a few uh, dream interpretations for people. And what I found is it's like, it's almost like revelatory because like, they'll tell you this dream and it seems really obscure and like, whoa, wow, what does that mean? Uh, But then when you go through all the different associations they have with all the different elements in the dream, some kind of pattern starts emerging where it starts almost uh, transmitting a message. And you even see the person talking it out and being like, oh, wow, that's really weird. Like, yeah, that, that, that seems like that's what the dream was trying to say. A lot of cases, you know, it, it had, dreams have solutions, you know, for our, our daily life, which is our minds are always working, trying to, you know, adapt to life. And dreams are one of the, I think, the main healing mechanisms of the psyche in general. I mean, someone's sleep deprived and don't get uh, dreams for a while, they start, you know, hallucinating, they start losing their mind, something about it, like mm-hmm. helps us. Um, do you have any, uh, any dreams from, like you said, you had recurring dreams? Is there mm-hmm. any other uh, recurring dreams that are interesting? I always find those particularly fascinating, because they, they, they're like, recurring dreams, from my understanding, they like circle around some kind of central theme of that person's life. Like there's yeah. some aspect of I mean, the big one is the one I mentioned before around the ocean, Mm. like waves, tsunamis, storms, hurricanes, like it's always ocean is like the theme. And it could be that I'm on the beach. It could be that I'm in a house right on the beach. And there is a fear element of the ocean. And I'm not afraid of the ocean. I love the ocean. I love swimming in the ocean. Like I have a normal respect for it of, you know, how things can go wrong, but there's, you know, there's none of that in my like daily conscious uh, or consciousness. But in my dream world, it tends to be very symbolic and Mm. reoccurs periodically, like not Mm. that often, but Mm. it's compared to other dreams I have. It's like, oh, there it is. There it is again. That kind of dream, I think, is uh, archetypal mm. in terms of 
you know, the biblical stories of floods and this idea of this kind of cataclysm that happens on the earth. I've actually, yeah. I've had dreams just like that too. Um, I had one where I was like, um, I was like on a raft, like on a wooden raft out in the middle of the sea. Mm-hmm. Like it must, everything must've been flooded or something. And I was like there with my brother and we were both on the raft and it was like stormy and really, really intense dream. Um, yeah. But I, what I think you were saying about it representing some kind of like massive change, I think is a, is an insight. And it's interesting too, that dreams speak metaphorically too. So you mm-hmm. might have like a cataclysmic type dream because some big transformations happening within you. And that's the way that the dream, you know, symbolically expresses uh, mm-hmm. that, that fact. Yeah, absolutely. What are your favorite mental health herbs? I always love talking <laughs> about, uh, about, about these ones, like yeah. things that are specific to the nervous system and the mind. Absolutely. So my favorite mental health herbs are probably, I love lemon balm and -hmm. passion flower. Mm -hmm. Those are two of my absolute favorites. I love lavender, Mm -hmm. whether we're talking a supplement where we're taking it by mouth or we're talking about aromatherapy. And sometimes I'll use essential oils mostly for grounding techniques where Mm -hmm. I think they can help whenever someone has a tendency to want to flee, like leave their body, have a panic attack, dissociate, uh, using different modalities to try to bring us back into the here and now. And so sometimes just using a scent can help us, you know, focus on that, meditate on that. Cause if you're trying to just use mindfulness and it's a brand new skill, it's going to be really hard. And so focusing on something really simple. So I love using lavender and sometimes I'll use it internally. Uh, in the supplement form, not the oil itself. And then what else? Ashwagandha, mm, for sure. Cool. If we're talking more pill form uh, or a tincture, I use ashwagandha. And then what else? Sometimes I'll use the adaptogens when people seem to have just a lot of stress, a lot of chronic stress. Cause that's another thing. If you're living with anxiety or depression, PTSD, can be really stressful over time just to be in your body. And so sometimes the adaptogens can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find those, uh, all the different, uh, ginseng and, and rhodiola. It's interesting mm-hmm. too, cause rhodiola, it helps with, you know, the stress response and cortisol and kind of building up the body. Uh, mm-hmm. but it also has a lot of serotonergic effects too. It has yeah. kind of specific, um, uh, uses like that. And I, I really like St. John's where it's probably one of my favorites. I just got a uh, uh, several pounds of uh, fresh St. John's wort that I'm making into a tincture. And it's like this beautiful yeah. red crimson, um, very powerful herb. It's yeah. a good one too, because it was used in, you know, uh, medieval times to cast away, you know, bad spirits. Yeah. Like, and uh, kind of what in those times, you know, were basically, you can describe it maybe as like anxiety, depression, mental health disorders, but they kind of viewed it uh, still in those still in those terms. Absolutely. I would also add saffron mm. as one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. It is kind of trendy right now because there was the one study where they compared it to Ritalin in kids mm. with ADHD and it was it was effective. And there's also some evidence in using saffron for depression. Mm-hmm. So I do, I do use saffron. It's, it's really expensive in the it's bulk so expensive. form. Yeah. I think it might be the most expensive herb. Yeah. Like, but it's it's not, if you compare it to paying out of pocket, let's say for a stimulant, if you don't have insurance, saffron is not necessarily more expensive. Like they make some formulations of it right now mm-hmm. for focus and, you know, ADHD kind of symptoms. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I've gotten pretty good results with some people with that. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I really like a uh, uh, passion flower too, especially yeah. if you make a really, really strong tea out of it. Mm-hmm. like five or, or 10 grams, then you actually, you actually feel like the kind of calm, anxiolytic, like anxiety relieving, uh, uh, effects of it. It actually yeah. even has, uh, supposedly some harmala alkaloids in it, which really? are kind of a MAOI. Like it's some of the compounds that are, that make up ayahuasca, but mm-hmm. it just has them in, in small, uh, small amounts. Which I, I find thought about it. It's also yeah, a weird what- plant. <laughs> it's like it's from like an uh, an alien world, doesn't it? With all the like, it doesn't. It's so different. Yeah, I love it. I will make 
on like a really stressful day, I'll make an infusion. I find passion flower to have a really just neutral kind of like I wouldn't grab like it doesn't taste bad, but I wouldn't grab it. I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm craving a big cup of passion flower tea. So I'll do passion flower with lemon balm, chamomile, and I usually add peppermint just because I love the taste mm-hmm. and just let that steep for a really long time. And that is my go-to. I always have those herbs on hand. Yeah, that's, that's super important to use those kind of uh, nervine relaxing herbs too. Mm-hmm. In our culture, it's like we only use the stimulant herbs. Yeah. You know, like people are using like coffee and tobacco <laughs> and all that. But like, there's also other herbs that calm you down, which are also mm-hmm. really helpful uh, in yeah. balancing you out and mitigating the effects of those other st- stimulant herbs. Yeah. And they make some nice glycerates of those herbs or you can use them with kids where they taste Mm. good and they can really help with that social anxiety or separation anxiety. So sometimes I'll, you know, recommend the the glycerate forms because the glycerin is sweet and, you know, makes herbs a lot easier to take. And those herbs specifically like lavender and St. John's wort, um, peppermint, lemon balm, any, any herb that's very like aromatic, they pull very well into glycerite. So I, I make, um, I make tincture products and we make alcohol free ones with the, with the glycerin for, for sale to yeah. people. Um, and I noticed that those blends, like one of them that has a uh, St. John's wort, lavender and chamomile in it, it, it tastes like amazing. And some herbs mm-hmm. are not that good in, in the glycerites, but those, yeah, are, those work well. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, I enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. We a lot of great topics. I'd love to have you on the show again. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gouge, for, yeah. uh, for enlightening us on mental health. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure.